All right, let's see. I'm going to give it a minute here because I was messing with it a little bit. Let's hope I'm still alive. Looks like I am. What's going on, guys? It's Tyler from TBO and MMA. So it's finally time for UFC 239, headline by one of the greatest fighters to ever walk the earth, if not the greatest fighter. John Bones Jones takes off the really experienced veteran. I was quite uh, surprised when I was looking at his record. 13-5 and five in the UFC, Tiago Santos, who's been on one of the most killer runs that he's had lately in the UFC. And also in the co-main event, the greatest female fighter, no question about it, the greatest female fighter to ever walk the earth, Amanda Nunes. Uh, fights in the co-main event. It's going to be a great night of fights. In International Fight Week, it's always a great time to be a fight fan. But anyway, to kick things off, here's Bruce Buffer. And now, presenting the champion, fighting out of the red corner, this man is a podcaster. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Podcasting out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, presenting the host of T-Bone MMA Podcast, Tyler T-Bone Brack. All right, thank you very much, Bruce Buffer. And what's up, Mario Yamasaki? Always happy to have you on. Hope you tune in tomorrow. But anyway, the first fight on the card, as, as you guys like to know, as you guys know, I usually start from the bottom to the top. So on the bottom of the card, in the women's 135 pound division. These fights are on ESPN Plus. The early prelims cards are on ESPN Plus. The preliminary card is on ESPN. Then the main card is only on pay per view. Again, that's the ESPN pay per view. So make sure if you're going to buy the pay per view, go to ESPN. I'm sure you know by now. Go to ESPN and you have to buy the pay-per-view through them. But anyway, the women's 135-pound division, we got Julia Avila versus uh, Pene Kianzad. Julia Avila, she's from Bakersfield, California. She's got a record of five victories with one loss, with two knockout victories, one submission victory, and two decision victories. Uh, Pian Kianzad is from Iran, fighting out of Sweden. She's got a record of 11 victories with four losses. Three of her victories were by knockout, zero by submission, and eight were by decision. Pian Kianzad stands at five foot seven, has a 68-inch reach. Uh, slightly taller, at three inches taller than Alvila. Kian Kianza, she's got a record of two, uh, zero and one in her UFC career with a record of two and three in her evicted career with one performance of the night bonus. She lost in the finals of the tough heavy hitters against um, Macy Johnson via rear naked choke. She'd also defeated uh, Jessica Rose Clark but lost to Tanya Evinger via TKO, which was a non-title bout. It was supposed to be a title bout, but she uh, failed. She, uh, I believe, missed weight. Lost to Raquel uh, Pialvili, and also lost to Sarah Kaufman in her Invicta career. She was 8-0 prior to losing three straight in Invicta, but since then went 3-1 with two with two victories as well in the Ultimate Fight and not including. That's if you include that it's 5-1 uh, in her last six fights. She was the Cage Warriors 135, Women's 135-pound champion. She began boxing at 14 years old, has over 30 amateur fights. She's a 2011 Nash, uh, women's uh, shoot fighter uh, winner in Sweden. And she replaces Melissa Gatto. She's also a purple, purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I believe that was as of June 24th, if I'm not mistaken. She's taking on, she's, uh, taking on Julia Alvila. She's, lo- she's making her UFC debut. She's got a record of 1-1 one one in a victory career, where she lost to Marisa Allen via TKO and defeated Alex Connors mm-hmm. via TKO via front kick. Uh, she also has victories over Marion Renault and Nico Montano. This is early on in her career. She also has two TKO victories and one submission victory via armbar. The next fight on the card is in the men's 170 pound division against between uh, Ismail Nadurov against Chance uh, Ret- Encounter. Excuse me, I'm gonna have a tough time pronouncing that one. Ismail Nadurov. He's from Austria. He's got a record of 18 victories with two losses. And this is one fighter in particular. I believe they call him the Austri- Austrian Wonder Boy, if I'm not mistaken. But he's one of the most underrated fighters on the card here tonight with an impressive record of 18 victories with two losses, with 11 victories by knockout, five by submission, and two by decision. Uh, he's definitely coming in one of the bigger favorites on the card here tonight uh, against Chance Rett Encounter. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 13 victories with three losses, uh, with six knockout victories, three submission victories, and four decision victories. Chance Rett Encounter stands at six foot, two inches tall, and has a 75 inch reach. Ishmael Nadurov, he's got a, he stands at six foot tall and a 74 inch reach. Ishmael Nadurov, he's 1-0 in the UFC, defeating Michael Pizarro's via unanimous decision, uh, where he landed 63 strikes in those three rounds at, back in February 2019 in his UFC debut. He was 14-1 and in his last 15 fights, so his only loss to Ismael De, De Jesus via unanimous decision. He's 3-1 and 
uh, an ACB organization, which is a Russian or MMA organization. He's on a three-fight winning streak with two knockouts in that three-fight winning streak with 11 knockout victories in total and five submission victories, including two Renega chokes, one triangle, an arm triangle, and one undisclosed submission. And like I said before, the Austrian Wonder Boy. How he got that name, I'm not sure. However, he's got a lot of hype behind him going 18-2 and two in his mixed martial arts career and defeating very handedly uh, Michael Bizarres. Michael Bizarres, 11-1 going into that fight, if I'm not mistaken. Definitely uh, showed a lot of potential in the UFC a 170 pound division that's always it was always kind of stagnant for quite some time and now it's starting to get a new flood of new up and coming prospects very similar i see a lot of uh i see a lot of parallels to the 205 pound division and we're seeing now new guys coming up and filling some of the roles of a lot of the experienced veterans that are now starting to retire and almost kind of slip down a little bit more and Ismail Nadurov, both fighters really chance threat encounter i'll get into him and i'll explain go into more depth with him in a second but Again, a very a lot of parallels between the 170 pound and 205 pound division, and this fight in particular is, uh, proves that. Chance Retton County, he's got a record of one victory with one loss in his UFC career with two and one record in Bellator. He lost to Bilal Muhammad via unanimous decision back in June of 2018 in his UFC debut. Then his last fight defeated Kyle Stewart via Renick Kachog uh, back in January 2019. He's five and one in his last six fights, and Kyle Stewart again was 11 and one going into that fight with Chat. Um, with Chance Rett encounter, so that's definitely a huge victory, even though it was a victory that came off of a loss in his UFC debut. It was definitely not an easy fight going into that one. He's got to sit so, uh, that in that fight against Kyle Stewart, he was stand at south, he stood southpaw, and eventually just got a takedown, rode his back, and eventually got the, the rear naked choke in the very first round. It was a very impressive performance, just showed that he had a lot of forward pressure and liked to get the fight down to the ground. I was unable to watch that fight against Bilal Muhammad, but I know Bilal Muhammad has a very good takedown offense, so I'm sure that caused him a little bit of problems. So I'm going to have to assume that Chance Renton Counter is going to try to take this fight down to the ground. All right, this next fight is the last fight in the uh, on the early prelims, only on ESPN Plus, between Edmund uh, Shaberzian and Jack Marshman. Another great fight on this card, and I'm also pretty surprised that it's not on the ESPN preliminary card. However, um, however, we are in for a treat for the uh, early prelims. Emin Shabazian, he's from the United States. He's got a record of nine victories with zero losses, with eight victories by knockout, zero by submission, and only one by decision. Eight knockouts in his mixed martial arts career. Facing off against Jack Marshman, he is from Wales. He's got a record of 23 victories with eight losses, 13 of his victories by knockout, five by submission, and five by decision. Jack Marshman stands at six foot, stands at six foot tall and has a 73 inch reach. Emin Shabazian stands at six foot two. I was not able to find a reach statistic for him. Let's start off with Edmund. He's got a record of two victories with zero losses in his UFC career. 3-0 you know, if you include the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. He defeated Antonio Jones via uh, TKO in only 40 seconds on the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series to earn him a spot in the UFC. And then he defeated Darren Stewart via split decision in his UFC debut. And then defeated Charles Bird in 38 seconds via TKO back in March of 2018, 2019 excuse me, in his last fight. And get this, he won't turn 22 until November and uh, Trent Ryan Smith of Sports Money on Forbes. I know this isn't a very great source. However, he did have an excellent interview with Edmund Shabazian. And uh, he's he's trying to set a goal for himself to try to become the youngest champion in UFC history. And he's got uh, lots of time to do it, actually. John Jones, of course, being the youngest champion in UFC history at 23 years and 242 days. And him not only 21 and got 2 0 in the UFC, especially in the 185 pound division. It's going to take a little bit more time for him considering the uh, level of competition. But depending on how impressive you look, Israel Adesanya is a great example. In just pretty much a year, he went from being a relatively unknown fighter to being the interim champion. And now, just recently, now it's fighting Robert Whitaker in a stadium, I believe October 5th in. Uh, in Australia. And this is an exciting card, especially considering that that's going to be in a cricket stadium. Uh, and they're roughly around 50,000 people in attendance uh, if they're able to sell out the crowd, which in Australia, I'm sure they will be. So we, they, we might actually be able to look at some attendance records on this card, on that card coming up. But then again, that's way in the future. However, it's something that I'm particularly pretty excited about because I love the old uh, stadium shows. Uh, he's the second largest favorite on the card, only behind John Jones. And I wasn't able to write down the uh, actual statistics. I will get into my picks tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning is when I'll have my picks and I'll have the most updated odds. Uh, because I usually have, the, I usually try to do my picks the night before. However, the odds like to change. So I'm going to do it tomorrow morning. 
and get accurate numbers for you guys tomorrow. However, that shows a lot of hype behind this kid. Again, 21 years old, nine victories with zero losses and eight knockouts. Another treat on the undercard here. So if you guys aren't able to get ESPN Plus, I'll definitely be covering this uh, this fight in particular. This one, the, the last two fights are going to be very exciting. Uh, Chance Rett Encounter and Ismail Nadurov. And Edmund Shabazian is another very exciting fighter on this card. However, he's got a tough, tough, tough competition in front of him against Jack Marshman. Jack Marshman going three and three in his UFC career with one performance the night bonus. And let's take a look at his record real quick. This is also one of those exciting fights where you have a fighter who's nine and zero with eight knockouts, and now he's going against a guy who has over thirty or over thirty uh, fights in his mixed martial arts career. So it's going to be the young up and comer against one of the more experienced fighters, and this is always one of the most fascinating matchups and a very important matchup, especially for the duration of uh, Edmund's career. He's the real story going into this fight. Of course, we can't sleep on Jack Marshman. However, the balls are definitely in Edmund Shabazian's court, to say the least. Because um, he's the one that's going to try to make a name for himself in this fight. However, if Jack Marshman's going to be able to get a victory in this fight, it's definitely going to put him forward in his in his career. But a lot more is on the line for Edmund Shabazian. But anyway, Jack Marshman, 3-3 three three in his UFC career. He made his UFC debut back in 2016 where he defeated uh, Mangus Kambaland via TKO in the second round. To earn himself performance of the night, then lost to Tiago Santos uh, back in February 2017. Then defeated uh, Ryan Jaynes, lost, then lost to Antonio Carlos Jr. via Renee Choke, and lost to Carl Robertson via unanimous decision. Then his last fight defeated John Phillips via split decision back in March 2019. After Jack Marshman missed weight, as of right now it is 6:36 Eastern time. Uh, I do not, I have not heard of anybody missing weight or any fights being called off. Knock on some wood, anyway. Uh, any fights being called off. Again, always International Fight Week. You always are on, walking on eggshells a little bit. Jack Marshman, he's the former Cage Warriors 185-pound champion, BA MMA champion, uh, made for the Cage 185-pound uh, champion as well. And he, I believe he defended each of those belts one time, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he defended the Cage Warriors title because I think he was signed on to the UFC immediately after that. He's got 13 knockout victories with five submission victories, including two arm bars, one triangle, rear naked choke. Two triangle chokes, actually, excuse me, and a rear naked choke. He's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and there's two paratroopers on this card here tonight, and that is in particular interest for me because, again, like I got my airborne wings up there, but he was a British Army paratrooper as well as a Lance Corporal in the 3rd Battalion Parachute Regiment for 10 years and also deployed to Afghanistan. The other one being Tackle Santos, and that one, look up MMA on point because they have a lot of great insight to a lot of these fighters that I wasn't even able to find through my research. Definitely look at them. Uh, they have a lot of great uh, information for the for the card here coming up tonight. When is it starting? When it's starting? It's starting tomorrow. I mean, getting their predictions out. See you tomorrow. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, tomorrow morning is when I plan to have those out. So I don't know. I plan to have some coffee with you guys tomorrow morning. Let's just say that. But yet again, another very exciting fight on the. Early prelims, so I'm very surprised that they have this fight in the early prelims, especially this fight in particular. I could definitely see on the pay per view card even uh, possibly knocking down Diego Sanchez and Michael Chiesa. I could see that fight headlining the ESPN card. If I were if I were the one in charge, I would have put this fight on the main card, considering that I want to hype up this Edmund guy. Uh, but none, nonetheless, if he's able to get a big knockout victory, people will talk, and that's what I always say. If you are the next big thing, people are going to find out about you. It doesn't matter where you fight. It doesn't matter who you fight. Um, so yeah, that's just another fight that I'm pretty excited about. The next fight is on the ESPN preliminary card between number in the in the men's 135 pound division uh, between number 14 ranked Alejandro Perez and Yad Yadong Yadong Song. Excuse me. And this is always my favorite division. You guys know that for sure. Alejandro Perez, he's from Mexico. He's got a record of 21 victories with seven losses and one draw. He's got nine knockout victories, five submission victories, and seven decision victories. He's facing off against Yadong Zhang. He's from China. He's got a record of 13 victories with three losses with four knockouts, three submission victories, and six decision victories. Uh, Alejandro Perez, he has a five foot six and has a 67 inch reach. And Yadong Zhang has a, stands at five foot eight and has a 67 inch reach. Number 14 ranked Alejandro Perez. He's got a record of seven victories with two losses and one draw in his UFC career with one performance of the night. He's coming off a unanimous decision loss to Cody Steinman at UFC 235. And let's take a look at his record. 
He made his UFC debut back at UFC 180 back in 2014, where he won the Ultimate Fighter Latin America Bantamweight Tournament, uh, defeating Jose Alberto Quinones via unanimous decision, and then lost to Patrick Williams via a guillotine choke. Then went on one of, the, one of his most impressive runs in his UFC in his mixed martial arts career, defeating Scott Jorgensen via TKO. Ian, Ian uh, it, Ince Witzel, excuse me, via TKO, and had a draw against Albert Morales, and had a split decision victory over uh, Andre Sokomthoff, uh, defeated Uriah Contra via unanimous decision, defeated Mat- Matthew Lopez via TKO, and defeated Eddie Wineland via unanimous decision. Coming up short against Cody Stammen back at UFC 235 back in March t- 2019 in his last fight. And his only draw was um, was pro- most likely due to points being deducted after hitting after the bell. And it was ended, ended up being a majority draw. So if it hadn't been for that one point deduction, I'm sure that would have ended up being a victory in his favor. Uh, he won the Ultimate Fighter Latin America back in 2014 at UFC 180. Uh, this fight was originally scheduled for 235, but Song pulled out due to... Um, but Song ended up pulling out for undisclosed reasons, and then he ended up losing to Cody Steinman uh, on short notice. He's facing off against Yadong Song. He's got a record of three victories of zero losses in his UFC career. Are we defeated uh, for Abad Kahandre via front choke, defeated Felipe Arante, Arantes via TKO, and in his last fight defeated Vince Morales via damn decision back in November 2018. Blaze versus Ninganu 2. Speaking of Francis Ngannou, I'm just going to go off on a tangent a little bit. What is going on? You know, he's one of those guys that just breaks all MMA math. You know, I'm one of those guys that usually never goes with the first round knockout artist. However, in his last fight against Junior Santos, I was like, I think he's going to knock him out. And sure enough, he did. And why, am I, why I'm shocked about that, I'm not sure. But now he's got to put himself in a position where he's probably going to be facing against the facing the winner of Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic, which which was a position that I never thought I'd see in him. And again, especially I saw, again I saw a lot of parallels with him and Shane Carwin. Shane Carwin obviously falling short against Brock Lesnar. Before that was knocking everybody out in the first round. I think every single one of his fights were via first round finish. That he only had one submission victory. Never got out of the first round. And then Brock Lesnar exposed a lot of holes. Once he's able to get out of that first round, uh, there's a lot of problems. However, when Fra- with Francis Ngannou, or excuse me, once Shane Carwin fought Brock Lesnar and got out of that round, he then fought JDS and lost via three round decision. It was just never the same again. I would have very much expecting Junior, or excuse me, Francis Ngannou to do the exact same thing. However, he keeps knocking people out, especially even after that fight with Derek Lewis. Even after that fight with Stipe and Miocic, I'm amazed of a crazy, crazy sport. But back to what I was talking about earlier, Yadong Zong, uh, he fought as high as lightweight and as low as 135 pounds in his uh, mixed martial arts career. He trains out of Team Alpha Male. He's got a TKO victory. Uh, excuse me, 75% of his strikes were standing with, only si- with 69% of his strikes to the head. So he obviously wants to keep this fight standing. All right, the next fight on the card is between uh, is in the women's 115 pound division. Number five ranked Claudia Gadelha against number 14 ranked uh, Honda Marcos. Number five Claudia Gadelha. She's from Brazil. She's got a record of 16 victories with four losses, with two knockout victories, seven submission victories, and seven decision victories. She's facing off against number 14 ranked Ronda Marcos. She's from Iraq, fighting out of Canada. She's got a record of nine victories with six losses and one draw, with zero knockout victories, four submission victories, and five decision victories. Claudia Gadelha stands at five foot four and has a 63 and a half inch reach. And guess what? Number 14 went Honda Marco stands at 5'4 with a 63 and a half inch reach. Number 5 went Claudia Gadelha. She's got a record of five victories with four losses in her UFC career. Going 1 and 0 oh in her Invicta career as well, with two, before, two fight of night bonuses and one performance of the night bonus in her UFC career. Let's take a look at her record. She made her UFC debut uh, back in 2014, where she defeated Tina Ladinamaki. Lamba- Lad- I'll be unanimous decision. If I'm not mistaken, that was the first women's 115-pound fight. Yes, it is, actually. The women's first 115-pound fight in the UFC. And then lost Yanni on JTEC via split decision in a non-title bout. That was before either fighter was fighting for the title. Uh, back in 2014, lost it via split decision where she was actually where she actually dropped Yanni on JTEC in that fight. Or I believe took her down several times. And in fact, when I looked at that, when I was watching that fight, I actually scored it to Claudia Gadelia. 
Uh, and then she defeated uh, Jessica Aguilar via unanimous decision, and then got another title shot, or got a t her first title shot against Yuani and Jacek, where she lost that fight via five round decision. Then defeated Courtney Casey via unanimous decision, defeated uh, Karolina Kowalkovich via rear naked choke, and uh, which earned herself performance of the night. Then lost to Jessica Andrade via unanimous decision, defeated Carla Esparza via split decision. And then lost Anita Anzara via unanimous decision back in December 2018 in, in Toronto, Canada in her last fight. Uh, she's a second degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with seven submission victories, including five arm bars and two rear naked chokes. Uh, she is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion uh, three times, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Rio International Open champion four times, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu national champion in Brazil seven times. She won the first women's 150-pound uh, fight, and she's gone three and two since losing her uh, title bout, losing Jessica Andrade and the current champion, and Nina Anzarov. She's facing off against number 14 ranked Nina Anzarov, or excuse me, uh, Honda Marcos. Excuse me, Ronda Marcos. She's got a record of five victories with five losses and one draw in her UFC career, with one fight of the night bonus and one performance of the night bonus. Let's take a look at her record. She made her UFC debut against Jess Jessica Penne. Um, where she lost that fight via split decision to earn herself fight of the night. At the Ultimate Fighter champion will be crowned finale back in December 2014. Uh, she defeated uh, Aisling De Daly via unanimous decision before losing to Karolina Kovalkovich via unanimous decision. Defeated Jocelyn Jones Lombarger via unanimous decision and then lost to Courtney Casey via armbar. Defeated Carla Esparza via split decision before losing to Alexa Grasso via split decision. Then she defeated Juliana Lima via unanimous decision and then lost to Nina Anzarov. Had a draw against um, uh, Marina Rod Rodriguez. And then her last fight defeated Angela Hill via armbar. So she's gone on a win-loss, 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 draw, win uh, streak in her since 2014. Really since the beginning of her career. She went 3-0, then lost her fourth fight in her mixed martial arts career. And has gone on a win-loss, win-loss, win-loss streak since then. Uh, she trains at a TriStar gym out of Canada. She's a purple belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with four submission victories, all four via armbar. So combined, both of these fighters have nine armbars. Uh, she's the Provinci Provincial Fighting Championships 115-pound champion, and she went 2-1 and one, the Ultimate Fighter, defeating Tisha Torres via unanimous decision, defeated Felice Herrig via scarf hold arm lock, then lost to Thug Rose via Kimura in the semifinal semi bout, then lost Je Jessica Penne in the finale. Okay, the next fight on the card is in the men's 135-pound division between uh, Marlon Vera and Nolene Hernandez. Marlon Vera, he's got a, he's from Ecuador. He's got a record of 13 victories with five losses and one draw, with four knockouts, seven submission victories, and two decision victories. He's facing off against Nolene Hernandez. He's got a, he's from the United States. He's got a record of nine victories with two losses, with three knockouts, zero submission victories, and six decision victories. Marlon Vera stands at five foot eight, has a 70 and a half inch reach. Well, no, Nolene Hernandez has, stands at five foot ten. I was not able to find a reach for him. Marlon Berry, he's got a record of seven victories with four losses in his UFC career with one performance of the night bonus. And again, a very experienced uh, UFC fighter with 11 fights going off again, going against a guy with uh, making his UFC debut. So it's going to be another interesting fight and a fight that I'm still kind of surprised is on the ESPN card. Nonetheless, anyway, Marlon Vera, he made his uh, UFC debut against Marco Beltran back at UFC 180 in November 2014 where he lost that fight via name's decision. Then defeated Roman Salazar via triangle choke back in 2015. Then defeated David Grant via Nian, or excuse me, lost to David Grant via unanimous decision. Then won a three fight winning. She defeated Nin uh, Ning Guanyu via unanimous decision. Defeated Brad Pickett via TKO head kick and punches. That I believe that ended up being Brad Pickett's last fight in Sphinx martial arts career. But one of the first people ever to finish Brad Pickett, one of the toughest human beings on planet Earth, with a minute and ten seconds left. Uh, in that fight. Then defeated Brian Kelleher via armbar before losing to John Lineker and Douglas Silva de Andrade, both via unanimous decision. Since then, went on a three fight winning streak, defeating Waluigi Buren via TKO, uh, Guido Canetti via rear naked choke, and his last fight defeated Frankie Sainz via TKO. With three finishes in a row back in March of 2019 in his last fight, in the very first round, uh, Black Belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with seven submission victories through three triangles, a heel hook, an armbar, rear naked choke, uh, and another armbar. He's finished six of, six of his seven victories in the UFC with three knockouts and three submission victories, including a knockout over Brad Pickett. And get this, this is something that I kind of found surprising through my research. Uh, Marlon Vera signed an advertisement deal with Pepsi. So if you go to Ecuador, apparently if you find a billboard for Pepsi, he's probably on it. So again, just something that I found kind of interesting nonetheless. 
So he's on a very, very hot streak. He's facing um, with three, going on a three fight win streak with three finishes in a row, uh, and finishing six of his seven victories in the UFC. Disregard what I said earlier, there's a reason why this fight is on the main card. Uh, he's facing off against Nolene Hernandez. He's making his UFC debut with 1 0 victory in Bellator and 1 1 in his LFA career. He's gone on a three fight winning streak, winning uh, via split decision, unanimous decision, and una unanimous decision. He's replacing Sean O'Malley as of July 2nd. He was actually supposed to face, at, uh, face off against an opponent in the main event of LFA 72. Or, excuse me, uh, LF LFA. Yeah, seven, that can't be it. But anyway, he's supposed to fight in, face, fight in the LFA card. In July, uh, and was had to be pulled off of that card, and eventually fight on this card. And let's take a look here, because I I literally just recently found out about this. Okay, Sean O'Malley was taken off the card due to a failed drug test. We all know about that now. And he was the rep Marlon Vera's uh, replacement opponent was supposed to be Draco Rodriguez from the King of the Cage. However, uh, King of the Cage refused to release him to go to the UFC, so Nalene Hernandez was the replacement for the replacement. So I'm certain once the odds come out tomorrow that he's going to be one of the bigger underdogs on this card here tonight. And other than that, he trains out of American Top, or excuse me, American Kickboxing Association alongside Danny Cormier, Luke Rockhold, and a lot of the greats out of there. And he's kind of a mystery fighter. I say that because according to SureDog, Tapology, a bloody elbow. They all have different records for this guy, especially his last three fights. I had a three-fight winning streak, and that's the one I went with. However, bloody uh, bloody elbow says he's on a four-fight winning streak. Sure Dog says he's only on a three-fight winning streak, and Tapology says he's gone four and one, losing his last fight. Um, so I'm just I was just kind of at a loss, like. Three different websites, three uh, different, very trustable websites. SureDog, Tapology, and Bloody Elbow are some of the best websites that you can look up for, especially a lot of fighters making their UFC debut. However, every single one of them says, says something different. So uh, when the fights come on tomorrow and he's making his entrance, I'm sure a lot of that will be alleviated. But it just adds a little bit more to the story of this fight, considering that he is a replacement for, Drac for uh, uh, Sean O'Malley. And was a replacement for his, his was essentially a replacement for a replacement. He's replacing Jaco Rodriguez, uh, and really took this fight as of July second. This is the, when it was last updated. I think that was officially when it was announced that he was going to be fighting on this card. So, again, an interesting story coming into this fight, and definitely a huge opportunity uh, against a very experienced veteran, Marlon Vera, who's on a killer streak of his own. So. Interesting fight, nonetheless, going into this. One that I'm definitely going to keep my eye on. All right, the next fight on the card. And it, this one's kind of a flashback. It's kind of a fun fight. Gilbert Melendez in the men's 145-pound division. Gilbert Melendez against Arnold Allen. Gilbert Melendez, he's from the United States. He's got a record of 22 victories and 7 losses with 11 knockouts, 1 submission, and 10 decision victories. Facing off against Arnold Allen. He's from the United Kingdom. He's got a record of 14 victories with one loss, with five knockouts, four submission victories, and five decision victories. Gilbert Melendez stands at five foot ten has a 73 inch reach, and Arnold Allen stands at five foot eight has a 70 inch reach. So a slight height and reach advantage for Gilbert Melendez. Gilbert Melendez, he's gone one in five in his UFC career, going uh, with two fighting night bonuses, three and zero oh in, in his WEC career, and get this ten and one in his strike force career. And I'll get to all of his records, especially in his uh, strike force career. However, after being one of the more dominant champions in Bellator history, lost a split decision against Benson Henderson for the lightweight championship, and then defeated Diego Sanchez in one of the most underrated 2013 fight of the year, according to the Wrestling Observer, uh, Sports Illustrated round of the year, back in 2009, that's something else, Inside MMA fight of the year, Bazzi Award, or according to Inside MMA. This is one of the most one of my most favorite fights that I've ever watched, ever. And it doesn't really get the recognition that I th believe that it deserves. Obviously, Diego Sanchez... This, this fight in particular could be in the UFC Hall of Fame for the greatest fight of all time, in my opinion. And Diego Sanchez is already on it uh, with this fight against Clay Guida. And get this, I'll get to a little bit more. I'll talk about Diego Sanchez more when he comes up. However, he is a current Hall of Famer. Just being inducted into the Hall of Fame is not fighting. Uh, here. He's, he went from being inducted into the Hall of Fame and pretty much just a couple days later fighting. That's pretty interesting. It's pretty special. It just adds a little bit more intrigue to his fight coming up. 
Anyway, Gilbert Melendez, let's take a look at his strike force career. He went 10 and 1 in his strike force career going way back with his only loss to Josh Thompson, uh, where he lost the strike force strike, strike force lightweight championship. Then in his next fight, defeated Rogier Adam via knockout uh, to win the interim strike force championship. And then he went on to defend the interim belt against uh, Mishruto Ishada via TKO. And then in a rematch against Josh Thompson, won the, won the unified strike force lightweight championship. Uh, via unanimous decision, then defeated Shinya Aoki via unanimous decision, defeated Tashiyan uh, Kawarji via TKO, defeated Jorge Masvidal, and Josh Thompson once again via split decision. What a great trilogy that they had. Uh, and let's take a look at all of his records that he set in his, in his uh, strike force career. He's got five su successful title defenses, with one, su one successful title defense of his interim belt, most championship bouts in strike force history, but 10. Most successful title defense. Title defenses in strike force history with six most consecutive strike title defenses in UFC most consecutive excuse me with four most wins in strike force history with eleven I counted ten I might might have made a mistake and most significant strikes ever landed in strike force history with seven hundred and forty nine he's a WEC uh, one hundred fifty five pound champion and at one point fought for the UFC title so he could have been one of the first people of he could have been the first person ever and probably the only person ever to win a WEC strike force and UFC belt. However, going one and five in his UFC career probably will never have that opportunity again. Going against a very tough fighter. He's, by the way, Gilbert Melendez is also a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with only one submission victory. And that one submission victory was a tap out due to punches. I never count that. And he, but however, he hasn't had a finish since 2011. He hasn't finished, um, hasn't had a finish when, since he defeated uh, Tatsuyon, uh, Tatsuya Kawarji via TKO back in 2011, where he defended his strike force belt. Other than that, he was finished against Anthony Pettis, and that's back in 2014. That's the last time one of his fights did not reach the judges' scorecards. He's facing off against 5 and 0 in the UFC, Arnold Allen, with two performance the night bonuses. So let's take a look at Arnold Allen's uh, UFC career. Arnold Allen made his UFC debut back in June 2015, where he defeated Alan Omer via guillotine choke. Then defeated uh, Yatsin uh, uh, Miza via unanimous know, decision. Defeated Marquand Americani via split decision. And he defeated Mads Burnell via front choke. And his last fight defeated Jordan Rinaldi via unanimous decision back in March 2019 in London, England. He's a purple belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with four submission victories, including rear naked choke, a triangle choke, a guillotine choke, and a front choke. Turned pro at 18 years old and won his first fight via knockout. He went 5 and 1 in his Cage Warriors career. And he went. He also, he also uh, was the M4 TC 155 pound champion. champion. Uh, I believe that was in his amateur career, if I'm not mistaken. So, again. This is one of those situations where it's a young up and comer gets an experienced veteran. However, the experienced veteran has gone one in five in his last six fights. Granted, to a very high level competition for Arnold Allen being five and zero in his UFC career, this is one of the more solid picks, I believe. Of course, I'm not making my picks yet. However, this is one of the more solid picks I have on this card here tonight. The next fight is only on pay per view. This is where the pay per view bouts start. What's up, Paul? Uh, this is in a very exciting fight between Diego Nightmare Sanchez or Lionheart Sanchez. He's changed his name like four times. I always go with Diego Nightmare Sanchez uh, against Michael Chiesa. Diego Sanchez is from the United States. He's got a record of 29 victories with 11 losses with nine knockouts, seven submission victories, and 13 decision victories. He stands at 5'10 and has a 72-inch reach. He's facing off against Michael Chiesa. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 15 victories with four losses with 11 submission victories and four decision victories with zero knockout victories. But don't underestimate his, not, his uh, striking ability. Uh, Michael Chiesa is a slightly larger fighter, standing at 6'1", and has a 75.5-inch reach advantage. Um, Diego Sanchez stands at 5'10", and has a 72-inch reach. Diego Sanchez, let's begin with him. He's got a record of 18 victories with 11 losses in his UFC career with seven fight of the night bonuses, which is a record, and one performance of the night bonus. The original Ultimate Fighter, Diego Sanchez, made his UFC debut uh, way back the Ultimate Fighter Season 1 finale where he defeated Kenny Florian via TKO to win the Ultimate Fighter Season 1 middleweight tournament. And that fight was right before uh, the fight that we know and love today, Forrest Griffin against Stefan Bonner. So in all reality, he was the first ever Ultimate Fighter. So 
again, something pretty exciting. I thought I'd throw in there. Throw in there. At that point in his career, he was 12-0 and and then defeated Brian Gassaway via uh, TKO, defeated Nick Diaz, defeated John Alessio, defeated Carl Parisian, and defeated Joe Riggs via knockout before losing to Josh Koscheck and John Fitch, both via decision. Uh, then went on a four-fight winning streak, defeating uh, David Belkin via submission due to punches. I always call that a TKO. Luigi Fiervoli via TKO, Joe Stevenson via unanimous decision, and Clay Guida which was fight of the year back in 2009, fight of the night, and now in the UFC Hall of Fame for one of the greatest fights of all time. Uh, and then he went off, went, then he went and lost uh, his only title bout against uh, BJ Penn. This was a prime BJ Penn. This is the BJ Penn that's beaten up on bouncers now and going nine straight losses in a row. This was vintage BJ Penn. And that fight, he didn't even really get finished, and it was a cut that opened up on his face. And this is a very important fight for T-Bone MMA, considering that this is the first ever pay-per-view fight that I'd ever watched. It always holds a special place in my heart. So Diego Sanchez, the first time I ever get to watch him on my stream, and going way back to 2009, little nine-year-old T-Bone watching this fight. It was one of the most fun fights I've ever watched. So I might be a little bit emotional when he's walking in, um, just thinking all the way back to then. But anyway... He lost his next fight against John Hathaway back at UFC 114, then defeated uh, Paulo Tiago, a Vietnam decision, defeated Martin Kampman, and really since then, he's kind of gotten a win-loss, win-loss streak, never really gaining traction. And this is the longest winning streak that he's had since 2011. Uh, he lost Jake Ellenberg, Ellenberger, then defeated Takanori Gomi, lost to Gilbert Melendez and Miles Jury, defeating Ross Pearson via split decision, uh, lost to Ricardo Lamas, defeating Jim Miller, lost to Joe Lozon via TKO, the first time he's been knocked out. Uh, in his career, really knocked out. The first time he's been knocked out in his career, obviously BJ Penn finished him, but that was basically due to a cut. Uh, and this is a very important fight. He defeated Marcin Held in his next fight. However, he lost to Ally Quentin via knockout and uh, lost to Matt Brown via knockout as well. But since then, he defeated Craig White via unanimous decision and his last fight knocked out Mickey Gall. Back in March 2019, shocking the world to earn himself a performance of the night. And his first finish since 2008. Let's take a look here. Back in 2008, he defeated uh, David Belkin, or excuse me, he defeated Luigi Fiervoli uh, via TKO. And since then, he hadn't finished a single fight until knocking out Mickey Gall. And now that he's getting some traps. This is the first time he's been gaining traction and started making a name for himself. Now that he's a Hall of Famer, he's facing off against a very tough opponent, Michael Chiesa, despite him jumping up in weight in his, if, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, his first fight at the 170-pound weight class. Um, or, excuse me, he defeated Carlos Conor via Kimura in his last fight, another experienced veteran. But, uh, Man, Diego Sanchez knocking out a young up-and-comer Mickey Gall in a fight that Diego Sanchez was really kind of a springboard for Mickey Gall to, to put to put it in. Uh, probably not the best way to put it, but you guys get the understanding. Uh, Mickey Gall uh, being one of those major stars, especially one of those young guys coming up, and Diego Sanchez does the unthinkable and knocks him out in the first in the second round. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and now gets him a spot on a pay-per-view card. I would have never expected him to be put in this position in ever, ever again in his UFC career. So all props to Diego Sanchez. Seven fighting that bonuses, the, tied for the most in UFC history with, and also one performance of the night. Seven-time Grappler's Quest champion at 170 pounds. Uh, he's gone two and one since his 170-pound return. He also had a fight with Clay Guida, if you guys haven't heard, and I'll probably mention it like five times by now. However... In the UFC Hall of Fame, he's fought as high as middleweight and as low as 145 pounds. Is now starting to go on a two-fight winning streak at 170 pounds. Who would have ever expected that? He's facing off against Michael Chiesa. He's got an 8-4 record in his UFC career with two fight of the night bonuses, two submission of the night bonuses, and two performance of the night bonuses. Michael Chiesa made his UFC debut against Ally Quinta. He won this fight via rear naked choke. Uh, to win the Ultimate Fighter of Season 15 lightweight tournament, which also earned him submission of the night. He also defeated Anton Kuivanen via Rene choke before losing to Jorge Masvidal via Darce choke. Defeated Colton Smith via Rene choke, Francisco Trinaldo via Nam's decision, and then losing to uh, Joe Lozon via Dr. Stoppage. And then defeated Mitch Clark, Jim Miller, and Benil Darush. Defeating Jim Miller and Benil Darush both via Rene choke. 
Before losing to uh, Kevin Lee via rear naked choke, shout out to unemployed Mario Yamasaki there, and Anthony Pettis via triangle before defeating Carlos Condit via one-armed Kimura in his welterweight debut back in uh, December 2018. He's the Ultimate Fighter Live winner where he faced off against uh, Ally Aquenta. And let's take a look here. This is why I said don't sleep on his stand-up game. Because he defeated Jonathan Vestian via Rene Kachok to get himself into the fight. Uh, into the Ultimate Fighter. Defeated uh, Jeremy Larson via Nam's decision in the preliminary round. Defeated Justin Lawrence via TKO in the quarterfinal round. Defeated James Vick via TKO in the semifinal round. So despite him not having a single knockout uh, on his record, he does have knockout ab ability. Uh, just not on his record. Even a lot of his fights, especially that fight against Ali Quinta, I keep referring to, where he ended up dropping Ali Quinta and finishing the fight via Rene Kachok. Uh, I love that style of lighting someone up on the feet, dropping them, and finishing via submission. I think it's a good way to not try to overexert yourself trying to go for a finish via TKO. Uh, he's a pro belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with 11 submission victories, including eight Renega chokes, a triangle choke, a Dars choke, and a Kimura. One arm Kimura, I might add. With two TKO victories in Ultimate Fighter, both against, or excuse me, against Justin Lawrence and James Vick. A very exciting card to be headlining the, or excuse me, to be uh, the first fight on the uh, main card. Watching the weigh-ins, I haven't. Uh, I'm not watching the weigh-ins right now, but my brother sent me something on UFC. That the UFC posted. I wonder what this might be. Shout out to T Bro. I'm sure he might be watching right now. However, the next fight is in the 205 pound division. Uh, Luke Rockhold against Jan Blahovich. Yeah, he sent me uh, Whitaker versus Adesanya. That's going to be a great one. I think, like I said previously, it's going to be in a stadium show. So that's going to be a very fun one. Uh, Luke Rockhold in the 205 pound division. Jumping up in weight. His first fight in the 205 pound division. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 16 victories with four losses, with six knockout victories, eight submission victories, and two decision victories. He's facing off against number six ranked Jan Blachowicz. He's from Poland. He's got a record of 23 victories with eight losses, with five knockout victories, nine submission victories, and nine decision victories. Jan Blachowicz is six foot two and has a 78 inch reach, and Luke Rockhold is slightly taller at six foot three, but has a slightly less reach uh, with 77 inch reach. Let's take a look at Luke Rockhold. He's got a record of six victories with three losses in his UFC career, with a 9-0 record in his strike force career. I'm going to go all the way back to his strike force debut where he defeated Josh Nail via TKL and went on a several fight winning streak, really finishing uh, every single one of his fights, uh, finished with a rear naked choke, rear naked choke, rear naked choke, rear naked choke, rear naked choke TKL, uh, and then had a unanimous decision. Also, one of those rear naked chokes was against Jesse Taylor. Uh, had a unanimous decision victory over Jacare Souza, TKO against Keith Jardine, a unanimous decision victory over uh, Tim Kennedy. That unanimous, unanimous decision victory over Jacare Souza won him the Strike Force Middleweight Championship, and he went on to defend that belt two times, both against uh, Keith Jardine and Tim Kennedy. Then he made his UFC debut against Vitor Belfort. Vitor Belfort um, was deep into the TRT back then and spinning wheel kicked Luke Rockhold and shocked the world. Back in 2014, back in May, I, I remember where I was, and I was, the, I, I think the weekend before, I had just finished middle school, to put some perspective on that. Anyway, then he defeated Costa Philippou, Costa Philippou, that was, that was a dig back in 2016, it was funny when Michael Bisping said it. Won that fight via TKO, via body kick, then defeated Tim Bosch via inverted triangle Kimura, which is something that you get from side control, and I don't think... If I'm not mistaken, I think that was the first time that was ever happened that ever happened in the UFC. Then defeated Michael Bisping via guillotine choke, a mounted guillotine choke. Then defeated Leota Machida via rear naked choke. Then defeated Chris Weidman to become the UFC middleweight champion and earned himself fight of the night after Chris Weidman threw a spinning wheel kick that missed and ended up getting punched in the face lots and lots of times. And then eventually went on to lose against Michael Bisping via knockout. And then Michael Bisping ended up fighting Dan Henderson. What a crazy sport that we have. I just love... The sequence of events here. So Chris Wyman was looking very good in that fight against Luke Rockhold before he threw that spinning wheel kick. And if it hadn't been for that one spinning wheel kick, I love the butterfly effect here. One bad decision by Chris Wyman ended up leading to UFC 204 where Dan Henderson fought Michael Bisming for the middleweight title. What a crazy sport that we that we all love. Anyway, uh, after nearly a year off, over a year off, defeated David Branch via TKO. And then back in February 2018, 
for the interim UFC middleweight championship, Yo Romero knocked the lights out of Luke Rockhold. And one of the most vicious knockouts that I've ever seen. And another important fight for T-Bone MMA because that was the first ever pay-per-view card that I ever covered live. Uh, lost that fight via knockout back in February 2018. With almost a year and a half gone from the sport, decides to jump up, up on weight uh, to take on Jan Blachowicz. But anyway, Luke Rockle, he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and won the 2007 IBJJF World Championship back in, in Long Beach. With eight submission victories in his, in his career with five rear chokes and armbar, inverted triangle Kimura, and a guillotine. Uh, he's only been to the decision twice in his last in his entire career. And he won both of them, defeating Tim Kennedy his last fight back in 2012. And this is including all of his losses. His fights either, since 2012, he's either been finished or he has finished his opponents. And no matter how you spin it, in this fight, I definitely see this fight not reaching the judges' scorecards. Uh, he's the Strikeforce 185-pound champion where he defended that belt twice. He's got the most finishes in Strikeforce history and most submissions with five. Uh, most finishes with seven. And he also trains out of American Kickboxing Association under uh, Javier Mendez. He's facing off against uh, number six ranked Jan Blachowicz. Jan Blachowicz, get this, he actually has more UFC fights than Luke Rockhold. I found that very surprising when I first saw this fight. Jan Blachowicz going 5-5 five and five in his UFC career with two performances in the night bonuses and one fight in the night bonus. And he had a very rocky start to his UFC career. He defeated Alir Latifi via TKO back in 2014, uh, uh, which is a great way to start off your uh, UFC career. Before, But then he lost Jimmy Manawa and Corey Anderson, both via unanimous decision. Then defeated uh, Igor uh, Pokrokic uh, via unanimous decision. Then lost to Alexander Gustafsson and Patrick Cummins, both via decision. Then went on a four-fight winning streak, defeating Den Devin Clark via standing... Bulldog choke. It was a very uh, unorthodox mission, to say the least. It was more or less like a standing rear naked choke. That's how I would describe it as. Something that I'd never seen before. Then defeated Jer Jared Cannonier via unanimous decision. Defeated Jimmy Manoa via unanimous decision. And then defeated Nikita Krylov via an arm triangle choke. During himself performance of the night. Uh, and then lost to Tiago Santos via TKO in the third round back in February of 2018 uh, in his last fight. Uh, he's the KSW 205-pound champion where he defended that belt twice, which is a uh, big organization out of Poland. Uh, he's the last 205-pound champion in that division or of that uh, organization. He's a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu with nine submission victories, including three arm bars, four rinka choke, a standing guillotine, and an arm triangle choke. With 30, That standing guillotine was like that standing bulldog choke. With 34 kickboxing victories in his career with 15 knockouts. Another interesting fight. Uh, very interesting storyline going into that fight. Jan Blachowicz. If he hadn't lost against Tiago Santos, would probably be getting that shot against uh, John Jones, which shows how big the implications are for this fight and how highly that we think of Luke Rockhold in the 205-pound division. If my thinking is, if he can't eat a shot from Michael Bisbing at 185 pounds, how is he going to eat a shot against a guy that fought as high as heavyweight before? This scares me. This scares. Uh, this scares me in particular. I think Jan Blachowicz is going to get a knockout victory in this fight. Anyway, this isn't where I'm making my predictions, but the predictions come tomorrow. But let me know if you guys um, disagree or agree with me there. The next fight is in the 170 pound division, and kind of a shocking grudge match. You both fighters that are pretty soft spoken, I guess to say the least. You Jorge Masvidal obviously had a brawl in his last fight. But other than that, doesn't really like to talk smack too much, but just has this disdain for Ben Askren for some reason. Uh, and Ben Askren just kind of trolling him a little bit. So, kind of hyping the fight up a little bit, I guess. Number four, Jorge Masvidal is from the United States. He's got a record of 33 victories with 13 losses with 14 knockout victories, two submission victories, and 17 decision victories. He's facing off against number five ranked Ben Askren. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 19 victories with zero losses with one no contest. With six knockout victories, six submission victories, and seven decision victories. Ben Askren stands at 5'11", has a 72-inch reach. And Jorge Masvidal, the surprising, sizable, uh, larger opponent, standing at 5'11", has a 2-inch reach advantage. Jorge Masvidal, he's got a record of 10 victories with six losses in his UFC career. Also going 2-1 in his Bellator career and 5-1 in his Strikeforce career. However, when he fought in Bellator, it's not quite the same Bellator that we know nowadays. Fighting in Bellator 1 and Bellator 5. Uh, and Bellator 12. But anyway, he made his strike force debut against Billy F. Evangelistida. Again, 
I have a tough time pronouncing that, that dude's name. Winning that fight via unanimous decision that defeated KJ Nunes via unanimous decision before losing to Gilbert Melendez via unanimous decision for the Strike Force Lightweight Championship. They won a three fight winning streak, uh, defeating Justin Wilcox, and then defeated Tim Means via unanimous decision in his UFC debut. And then defeated Michael Chiesa via Darce Choke, lost to Rustam Kabulov uh, back in 2013. Then won a three fight winning streak, defeating Pat Healy, uh, Darren uh, Kuchniak, and James Krause, all via unanimous decision. Before losing to Ally Quinta via split decision, then defeated Cesar Ferreira via knockout, then lost to uh, Benson Henderson via split decision, Lorenz Larkin via split decision, uh, and then defeated Ross Pearson, Jake Ellenberger, and Donald Cerrone, defeating Jake Ellenberger and Donald Cerrone via TKO. Then lost to Damian Maia by, get this, split decision. Then lost to Steven Thompson via unanimous decision. And his last fight shocked the world, knocking out Darren Till in his home country in London, England. Uh, to earn himself performance tonight and fight of the night, he came home with a pocket full of cash on that night. Uh, he hasn't been finished since 2009, something that was worth noting. He lost to Gilbert Melendez for the Strike Force 155 pound championship. He trains out of American Top Team. He's been pro since 2003 with his first pro fight at, two th- at 18 years old. He's gone 5 and 4 since his uh, 170 pound return in his UFC career. He's facing off against one of the greatest wrestlers in mixed martial arts history, Ben Askren. Ben Askren going 1-0 in his UFC career with 6-0 and 1-0 contests in his 1FC career and 9-0 in his Bellator career, remaining perfect in all three organizations and throughout his entire mixed martial arts career. Let's take a look at his record. Uh, he defeated Ryan Thomas twice to early on in Bellator's uh, history. Then won the Bellator Welterweight Championship against Lehman Good via unanimous decision. And then defeated Nick Thompson via unanimous decision in a non-title belt. Didn't defend his belt in that fight. Then defended that belt three time, four times, excuse me. Later vacated the belt and then fought in one FC, defeating uh, Basiar Abasa via an arm triangle back in 2014 in Singapore. Uh, then went on to win the welterweight championship. That was really 185 pounds. Um, and one FC, the weight class are a little bit different. Had a uh, no contest against Luis Santos via accidental eye poke. Then defended that belt, let's see, one, two, three, four, five times. And then he made his UFC debut back in 2000, March of 2019 after almost two years off. Uh, defeated Robbie Lawler via bulldog choke. And again, uh, one of the most controversial stoppages so far of this year. But again, I'll leave that debate for a different day. Uh, he's a former Bellator 170-pound champion where he defended that belt four times. Most title offenses in Bellator history. He also took sixth place at the Olympics, uh, going two and one, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in the, ultimate, in the Olympics. One FC 185 pound champion, where he defended that belt three times. He's an NCAA Division One All American from 2004 to 2007, an NCAA uh, finalist four times. And he's an NCAA Division One Collegiate National Champion from 2006 to 2007. He's also the Big 12 Conference Champion in 2004 and 2006 to 2007. He won the 2005 Pan American Games and 2008 uh, United States and uh, Games in freestyle wrestling. And something again, it was Wikipedia that told me this. Uh, not always the most reliable source. However, he's a 2011 amateur disc golfing champ. Took second place in uh, the 2011 amateur world amateur disc golfing championships. Just shows the kind of personality that this guy has. He's really out there. However, he's 19 and 0, and one of the scariest fighters going against one of the better stand-up fighters in the 170 pound division. Tough fight for Jorge Masvidal, in my opinion. However, I didn't have him defeating. Uh, I didn't have him knocking out Darren Till. So anything can happen. Anyway, the co-main event, and we have two probably the most. Let me let me just say this: the greatest male fighter of all time and greatest female fighter of all time. We are lucky enough to have two of the best fighters to ever walk the earth, female and male, to fight on one night. We are very lucky, and with again, knock on wood, no problems as of right now. Um, very lucky that everything lined up, and there was really no big injuries. Obviously, that uh, Sean O'Malley incident was pretty disappointing, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be alleviated here pretty soon. Uh, but anyway, in the co-main event for the women's 135-pound championship, uh, number six pound-for-pound fighter in the world and champion Amanda Nunes, champ champ Amanda Nunes, uh, she's from Brazil. She's got a record of 17 victories with four losses with 12, 12 knockout victories, three submission victories, and two decision victories. 
Uh, she stands at five foot eight, has a 69 inch reach. She's facing off against number two ranked Holly Holmes. She's from the United States. She's got a record of 12 victories and four losses with eight knockout victories, zero submission victories, and four decision victories. Holly Holmes stands at five foot eight and has a 69 inch reach. Everything is virtually identical going into this fight. The big story of this fight, can lightning strike twice? Holly Holm had one of the biggest upsets in all of sports history, at least we thought at the time. Um, if she's able to get past Amanda Nunes, is that going to be the greatest upset in UFC history? Does that outweigh her upset against uh, Ronda Rousey? I think it does. But again, we'll just have to see because Holly Holm, she shocked the world once. And I swear to God, if she, if she wins this the, this fight against Amanda Nunes, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, this sport is just crazy enough that it might happen, you know? If she's able to strike, if Lightning's able to strike twice and she's able to come, to, okay, I'll talk about it after I go through the statistics. Anyway, champion Amanda Nunes, champ champ Amanda Nunes, she's got a record of 10 victories with one loss in her UFC career, going 1-1 in Invicta and 1-1 in her strike force career. Let's take a look at her UFC career. Uh, she lost her, or she defeated Shelia Gaff via TKO. Uh, and her, she defeated Shelia Gaff via TKO in her UFC debut. Defeated Jermaine Duraname via TKO. Lost to Kat Zingano via TKO. Uh, back in 2014, that ended up being her last loss of her career as of now. Defeating Shanna Baszler via leg kick. Sarah McMahon via rear naked choke. Valentina Shevchenko via unanimous decision. Misha Tate via rear naked choke. Ronda Rousey via TKO. Valentina Shevchenko again via split decision. Raquel Pennington via TKO. And Chris Cyborg via knockout. Get this. This is the craziest thing that I that I think I've ever seen. She holds wins over five current and former UFC champions, defeating Ronda Rousey, who is the most dominant female champion, still currently, defended her belt seven times, defeating Misha Tate, who is the former 135 pound champion, defeated Jermaine Duraname, the person that beat Holly Holm for the 145 pound title and eventually uh, relinquished the belt to not fight Chris Cyborg. Knocked out Chris Cyborg to become the women's 145 pound champion and defeated Valentina Shevchenko twice. And get this, Valentina Shevchenko is the only person she's gone to, uh, to a decision to in her entire mixed martial arts career. She did it twice. That shows how good Valentina Shevchenko is and that shows how highly I think of Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, and if you really want to put the two greatest female fighters of all time together, I think you put Valentina Shevchenko and Amanda Nunes at 135 pounds again. That or if Amanda Nunes can somehow shock the world and make 125 pounds. Let's see if she can get a third belt, maybe. So much you can do there. But no matter how you spin it, I want to see Valentina Shevchenko against Amanda Nunes. Uh, don't really care what weight class that might be at. Anyway, champion Amanda Nunes. She's the bandweight champion where she defended that belt three times and the current featherweight champion. She's 2016 and 2018 female fighter of the year. And she also had 2018 knockout of the year and 2018 upset of the year. She holds wins over five UFC champions. Like I said before, she's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and a brown belt in Judo with three submission victories, all three of the uh, rear naked choke. And it's not necessarily that she takes her opponents down and then dominates them with her grappling. She drops her opponents and ends up finishing the fights via rear naked choke. She trains out of American Top Team. Uh, and get this. Uh, this is something that I found pretty interesting too. Her pay-per-view buys. Uh, the first fight that she ever headlined was UFC 200, uh, where that sold one, 1 million pay-per-view buys. And really, she was the co-star on that fight. Even though she was the headliner of it, we still had Brock Lesnar, and it was UFC 200. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up, there's multiple cards. Uh, UFC 207, where she was the headliner against, uh, against Ronda Rousey. Uh, that did 1.1 million pay-per-view buys. And UFC 232, that did 700,000 pay-per-view buys, where she was the co-main event. The co-main event, and when she, when she is kind of like the, not necessarily the feature fighter, let's just say that, her pay-per-views do very, very well. Uh, each of them doing combined, let's see, 2 million, pretty much 2.8 million pay-per-view buys and only three fight cards where she's not necessarily the headliner of the card. Uh, but the fights that she does headline, UFC 215, her fight against Valentina Shevchenko only did 100,000 pay-per-view buys. And uh, her fight against Raquel Pennington only did 85,000 pay-per-view buys. Um, of course, with this ESPN thing, it's really messed, jacked up the pay-per-view buys. So we can't really have an accurate number anymore because they're so shockingly low. Um, but I'm interested to see how much attention Amanda Nunes is going to get now, especially after knocking out Chris Cyborg in such a huge uh, card. 700,000 pay-per-view buys. And then she also knocked out Ronda Rousey, which did 1.1 million. 
Uh, but just that Ronda Rousey thing, that did not have enough to uh, have her headline a card on her own, especially if she's the co-main event on this card. However, she always proves it time and time again that she is one of the best and most fun female fighters to ever watch. So if she's going to be the biggest draw for female fighters, that's the question that I'm trying to pose here. It's going to be interesting to see exactly how much attention she's brought on already. Uh, you see ESPN talking about her. She's really starting to come, become a star of her own. So it's going to be interesting to see in the future. Anyway, she's facing up against number two ranked Holly Holm, the preacher's daughter home. And let's take a look at her UFC record. She's got a record of five victories and four losses in her UFC career with two fight of the night bonuses and two fight performance of the night bonuses. She made her UFC debut against Mario Renault where she won that fight via name decision. Or excuse me, against uh, Raquel Pennington, where she won that fight via split decision, then defeated uh, Marion Renault via unanimous decision, before jumping up, really leapfrogging a lot of fighters. A lot of people are pretty upset about the fact that she got a title fight, because I think if not, if I'm not mistaken, she was number ten ranked going into that fight. And it's easy to say, looking back at it now, how horrible of a striker Ronda Rousey was, but at that time she had just come off a knockout victory over Betch Kohea, and nobody thought. Uh, that number, I think, actually, I think it was number seven rank. Number seven rank, Holly Holm, was going to do even touch Ronda Rousey. And she went on to shock the world, dominating Ronda Rousey, and won that fight via knockout to win the Women's Bantamweight Championship, turn herself performance of the night and fight of the night, and also the largest attendance ever at a UFC card. And then she went on to fight in one of the greatest cards of all time at UFC 196 in the co-main event against Misha Tate in one of the more fun fights that I've ever seen. Lost to Misha, pa Misha Tate via Rene Kachok in the final uh, minute and minute and thirty seconds of that card of that fight, and then she lost to Valentina Shevchenko via an decision in a fight that get this Holly Holm is one of the greatest boxers and kickboxers that the UFC has ever seen, uh, most probably the most credentialed that we had ever seen, not just for females but for males too. She's probably the most credentialed fighter um, striker in UFC history. Period. She's the International Female Boxing Association welterweight and middleweight champion, IBA world uh, welterweight champion three times, lightweight light welterweight champion three times, um, and that's just to name a few. She's got a 33 and two boxing record and a 14 and one and seven kickboxing record. And these are professional bouts; these aren't amateur bouts. Uh, she also won the inaugural Legacy FC 135 pound championship. However, in terms of the most credentialed striker in UFC history. I think she surpasses a lot of the males. If I, I really put her in terms of not necessarily the best striker per se, but the most credentialed. I definitely put that uh, her in definitely the top three category. And that shows how good Valentina Shevchenko is and how highly I think of her because Valentina Shevchenko out kickboxed Holly Holm. Of course, she didn't knock her out, but really outstruck Holly Holm and out Holly Holm, Holly Holm, if that makes any sense. Shows how good Valentina Shevchenko is. Then she lost uh, her featherweight championship fight against Jermaine Naranime, and then knocked out Bechko Hea via head kick. And this is the point, uh, one of the more important fights in her career, considering that she's on a three-fight straight losing streak. And we're really thinking, okay, she doesn't have that anymore. She's the Buster Douglas in mixed martial arts. She will win the title and never be the same ever again. And then she went and knocked out Bechko Hea the way that she did, and then via a vicious uppercut following that head kick. We knew that she, there was something still left in her and that ended up uh, earning her performance of the night. Then she went on to fight Chris Cyborg for the Women's Featherweight Championship, uh, where she lost that fight via an decision, then uh, defeated Megan Anderson, and showed how good of a wrestler she was. Took down Megan Anderson and demolished her um, with her wrestling back in June 2018 in her last fight. Uh, already went through her boxing and kickboxing credentials, 32-2 and two kickboxing record and 14-1 and one and 7 kickboxing record. 2015 upset and knockout of the year against Ronda Rousey. Uh, what Amanda Nunes, she Amanda Nunes did the same thing Holly Holm did to a degree, where she knocked, they both knocked out probably unanimously agreed, unanimously agreed greatest female fighter at the time. Um, 2015. 2015 knockout of the year and upset of the year against Ronda Rousey. Man Nunes did the same thing. Knockout of the 2018 knockout of the year and upset of the year, but against Chris Cyborg. 2000, number two ranked Holly Holm. 2016 SB for upset of the year. 2016 SB. That's all of sports in general. Not just mixed martial arts. Not just combat sports. That's all sports in general. 
And she's also a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. However, she's got no submission victories in her career. If Holly Holm's able to, if if Holly Holm is able to do this again, if she's able to knock out Amanda Nunes and have one of the biggest upsets in mixed martial arts history, if not in sports history in general, and do it again, I don't even know what I'd do. I don't even know what I'd think. But we're looking at it and looking at this fight. Of course, I have Amanda Nunes winning this fight. But I'm not counting out Holly Holm. She might do it again. And if she does it, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how I'd react. It just... I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it. It would take me a night to believe it. I would have thought I was dreaming. Anyway, Holly Holm's going to get knocked out. She can't even evade all of Amanda, Amanda's punches. Ron and Evolve, you're exactly right. But anything. Anything can happen. Um, anyway, I've been talking for a very long time. A minute and five seconds. This is one of, long, one of the longest previews that I've ever done. However, it is necessary because... A lot of these fighters have a lot. That's typical. That's pretty typical for the International Fight Week previews that I do. A lot of descriptions for a lot of fighters. Anyway, the main event of this card, the 205-pound championship, and really a division that's brought on new life, especially with new up and covers. Even though Tiago Santos has lots of fights, he's got 18 fights in the UFC, is really kind of a newcomer per se, especially to the top 10 rankings. And it's just become flooded as more and more... Uh, experienced veterans are starting to kind of dwindle a little bit more. This new breed of fighters are starting to come up. And even though Tiago Santos has been in the game for a long time, uh, with over 27 fights in his career, 18 of which in the UFC, uh, is really becoming an, a part of this new flood and kind of leading the charge a little bit going, let's see, I think he's on a five-fight winning streak, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, champion John Jones, he's from the United States. He's got a record of 24 victories with one loss, whatever. And one uh, no contest. Again, whatever. With 10 knockout victories, 6 submission victories, and 8 decision victories. Uh, he's facing up against number 2 ranked Tiago Santos. He's from Brazil. He's got a record of 21 victories with 6 losses with 15 knockouts. Excuse me. With 1 submission victory and 5 decision victories. John Jones is a much bigger fighter. staying at 6 foot 4 and it's an 84 and a half inch reach. Tiago Santos stands at 6 foot 2 and has a 76 inch reach. Um, so an eight and a half inch reach advantage for Tiago Santos. Dana White's trying to build this fight up as Tiago Santos being bigger, uh, if not as big as um, John Jones. When in all reality, it's not even close. In terms of length, it's not even close. Anyway, number two ranked Tiago Santos. He's got a record of 13 victories with five losses in his UFC career. Let's take a look at his record. He made his UFC debut all the way back in 2013. Uh, back at UFC 163, where he lost to Cesar Ferreira via guillotine choke, and then defeated uh, Jaime Marquez via TKO. Then lost to Uriah, Uriah Hall via name's decision. Then went on to go on a four-fight win streak, defeating uh, Andy Enns via TKO, Steve Bossy via knockout, Elias Thurdo via name's decision, and Nate Marquardt via knockout. Then lost to Gegard Mousasi and a uh, Eric Spicely, both via finish. Then defeated Jack Marshman uh, via TKO, Gerald uh, Marshart via TKO, Jack Hermanson via TKO, and Anthony Smith via TKO. Then lost to David Branch via knockout, which kind of stumbled him a little bit in terms of like uh, his spot in the rankings. But went on a four-foot win streak. By the way, all of this in a calendar year. Defeating Kevin Holland via Nam's decision, defeating Eric Anders via TKO, defeating J Jim Manoa via knockout, and Jan Blahovich in his last fight via TKO. And he's got the UFC record, tied for the UFC record for most fights in the calendar year. And uh, he fought five times in 2018, where he knocked out Anthony Smith, got knocked out by David Branch, then defeated Kevin Holland, Eric Anders, Jimmy Manoa. And his last fight in February 2019, uh, won that fight via knockout. So in terms of February of 2018, he's fought six times. Um, and really just his career has taken a life of its own now. And he's not the same fighter he was back then, considering he's gone eight and one in his last nine fights. A lot of people are giving him. Of course, it's easy to uh, brush him away, considering that he's fighting the greatest fighter of all time. However, if there's a guy that could probably knock out John Jones, Chao Santos might be the guy. Of course, we never see it coming. However, he, this is the crazy sport, ladies and gentlemen. Even though uh, it's against John Jones, and nobody has even come. Close, aside from Alexander Gustafson. And that fight was kind of an anomaly, considering that uh, we really show... Let me explain a little bit more. John Jones was on cocaine going into that fight. Uh, or at least was partying a lot going into that fight. And now we see John Jones 
that performance he had against uh, against Alexander Gustafsson in his last fight, he's a completely different fighter, completely better version of himself. If I'm not, if if you guys agree with me, um, just the craziest, craziest thing. He he kind of controls fighters without even touching them. It's kind of voodoo control. There's a great inside MMA. Dan Hardy has a great explanation going looking into that, but it's really his vision. And his distance management is incredible. And it throws off fighters. But I think Tiago Santos might cause John Jones just a little bit more problems considering his forward style. And if I think that if there's a way that you can beat John Jones, I think you have to attack him. That's what a lot of problems that like Alexander Gus is in, especially in John Jones' last couple fights. Uh, Anthony Smith definitely comes to mind where they just were kind of lackadaisical a little bit. They weren't able, willing to pull the trigger considering that they were fighting the greatest talent that the UFC has ever seen, ever. I don't think Tiago Santos is going to do this. I think he's got enough experience behind him uh, that he's not going to freeze up against a guy like John Jones. And I think he's got that forward pressure where he's able to at least make this a little bit more of a fight than we're expecting. Even though I have John Jones winning this fight, I think Tiago Santos is going to impress some people here. Anyway, he's got the tie for the most fights in the calendar year with five as a black belt Brazilian, Jiu- Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with one submission victory via Reina Gachok back in 2011. He was on Tough Brazil where he went 2-2. Two and two. He lost the preliminary round, then won the wild card, and then lost to Leandro Santos. He was MMA junkie 2018 under the, radar, under the radar fighter of the year. He's facing off against champion John Jones. Let's take a look at his record. He made his UFC debut. It seems so long ago, but he's only 31 years old. Made his UFC debut back at UFC 87, back in 2008, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Brock Lesnar fought Heath Herring that night. Andre Guzmayo via unanimous decision, then defeated Stefan Bonner via uh, unanimous decision, defeated Jake O'Brien via guillotine choke, and then viciously lost against Matt Hamill after Matt Hamill used his face against uh, John Jones' elbow to get himself a disqualification victory. I'm obviously being very sarcastic there. John Jones, one loss, should be 24-0. However, a disqualification loss that he's not even upset about. But I'm probably more upset about him. Uh, uh, I'm probably more upset about this than he is, or at least that's what we leads us to believe. Then defeated Brendan Vera via TKO. In fact, shattered his face. I think he had an orbital fracture after that fight, if I'm not mistaken. And then defeated Vladimir Matyushenko via TKO. And then defeated Ryan Bader via uh, guillotine choke. And then stepped in to place Rashad Evans, one of his former teammates, to take out Mauricio Shogun Hua on short notice. In a fight where Mauricio Shogun Hua was one of the scariest 205 pound champions that we had ever seen. And he went in there and completely dominated. Ended up finishing Mauricio Shogun Hua in the third round, causing Shogun to tap out, actually. If you guys look, he tapped out. He dropped and he tapped out due to a TKO, punches and knees, and Three rounds were just dominance. Then defeated Quentin Rampage Jackson, former champion. Leo Machida, former champion. Rashad Evans, former champion. Vitor Belfort, former champion. Chael Sonnen, former champion of Trash Talk. Uh, Teddy Challenger, I should say. Um, then defeated Alexander Gustafsson, one of the toughest fights of his career, if not one of the greatest fights ever in UFC history. Then defeated Glover Teixeira, defeated Daniel Cormier, defeated Ovin St. Prio. This is where his career kind of took a little turn. That fight against Daniel Cormier, he won the fight, and then look at this. Uh, he extended the record, then got stripped for the belt for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to get into all the different reasons. Then defeated Ovin St. Prude, become the interim light heavyweight champion, and then stripped of the belt. Then defeated Daniel Cormier, and then stripped of the belt. Overturned to a no contest. Then he ended up winning the belt against Alexander Gustafsson back in 2018. Uh, back in December 2018, and then defeated Anthony Smith back in March of 2019. Um, despite him being deducted two points in round four after a uh, strike after the bell. So we're in for an excellent treat. After fighting only two times uh, in three years, really. Three times, or excuse me, two times in essentially three years. He's fighting three times in the last eight months now. So we're really lucky to have John Jones. Uh, he's never had problems with his health. However... Not get in trouble, not have any USADA violations. Of course, he had that weird um, picogram or whatever against Alexander Gustafson that got that fight moved. Whatever it was, it was enough to move the fight from Las Vegas to Inglewood, California on just a couple hours' notice. 
or excuse me, on a couple of uh, days' notice. Uh, but anyway, John Jones, four fight of the night bonuses, one knockout of the night bonus, one submission of the night bonus, and one performance of the night bonus. One of the few fighters in UFC history to ever have all four different types of bonuses. And he'll probably be one of the last fighters to ever have it. Um, he was one. He won the title, was stripped of the title, won the interim title, was stripped of the title. He won the title and then stripped of the title, and now he eventually won it back. <laughs> that was the sequence of events for four years, really. Going back to January of 2015. What a... Crazy sport that we love. Uh, and he was a blue ball Brazilian jiu-jitsu with six submission victories, including three guillotine chokes, one standing guillotine, Americana, and Rene Kachoke, considering that he's standing guillotine, a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and Americana, another black belt in jiu-jitsu. He is, despite him being black, uh, only a blue belt, I think we can all agree that he is uh, definitely high up there on the uh, mixed martial arts uh, submission rankings, I should say. Uh, he's the National Junior College All-American and National Champion. He was a New York State High School Division I state champion in 2005, and he had 2013 fight of the year against Alexander Gustafson. Again, this uh, preview went a little bit long. What's up, California love? Um, but yeah, it's going to be a great night of fights. Please tune in tomorrow. It's going to be very fun. It's, it should be a fun stream, and we're getting so close. I'm 953 subscribers, if I'm not mistaken. I'm thinking we're going to hit 1,000 tomorrow, so it's going to be a very exciting night. Uh, if we hit 1,000, I'm going to celebrate. I'm not going to know how. Uh, I'll probably crack open another Monster Energy, but nonetheless, it's going to be a very exciting night of fights. And if we reach 1,000 subscribers, we'll have some sort of celebration together. Uh, and by the way, in other news, uh, someone approached me with sportsbooth.tv. I tried it out, and I wasn't too... Um, I might have to try it again, try it out again tomorrow, uh, but I had a tough time trying to figure it out. At least it's once my channel evolves a little bit more, I think it's going to be a great way to start uh, streaming in different areas like sports booth, like Twitch. Uh, but YouTube will always be my primary. Uh, but then again, a thousand subscribers is going to be a huge milestone, so hopefully we'll be able to reach that tomorrow. But anyway, nonetheless, I have my picks out tomorrow morning. It's going to be a uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm. I, it, the, there's a lot of huge favorites going into this car here tonight, and I'm going to have to pick some underdogs. So anyway, I'll catch you guys tomorrow for the quick picks, and then tomorrow night will obviously be the uh, UFC 239 live play-by-play. -play. So anyway, this is Tyler for TOMA, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.